So I hope everyone was able to see, um, see I'm getting a lot of comments in the comments. Um, oh, sorry. Um, let me see, do I need to play that again? Um, I think we got the gist of it because there was um, there was subtitles, so I think that's fine. But is it still playing on your side? And then um, Sunita's also shared a link to the video um, on YouTube so people can watch it later. Oh, great. Thanks, Sunita. So I'd like to just share a few thoughts around um, the video we just saw. And... Oh dear, technology. <laughs> so one of the, I think what we gained from this video is really talking about the role of media and what kind of responsibility we have as media practitioners, media editors, and also media consumers. Um, so if you look at my screen right now, I've got this picture of a little girl because one of the things I thought about um, when, we, when we were planning this panel is, you know, growing up, we were conditioned, or I was conditioned as a young girl, and I saw it with many of my friends as well, to think about myself a certain way, to think about my body a certain way and my presence in relation to men. Um, and a lot of what I was hearing outside in society was what I was seeing on television and vice versa. So when we talk about the role of media, we're not just talking about uh, what you write, what you, what, what you, what you film and you know, the videos you produce, but we also, we're really talking about changing the narrative. We're talking about really using the power of media to reimagine what our gender, what, what our genders mean and um, the role that we all play in, in society in, in the fight against gender-based violence. Um, so, sorry, oh so um, earlier this year, there was a, a, a um, Earlier this year, there was a bit of uh, a controversial issue that took place in Kenya where these guys from Homeboys radio stations were basically sort of victim blaming. They were victim blaming saying that women are responsible for how they dress and you know some of these things happen because our society has changed. And I thought this was really interesting because within the same week, the Turkish president Erdogan had renounce the convention to protect the rights of women and, and girls. And these were things that were happening on different parts of the world, but pretty much around the same time. And it got me thinking that a lot of these things that we say and we hear um, are because of how we grow up, because of how we were, we were taught and they were normalized. So growing up, I, I knew it was normal that I need to I need to sort of shrink my body. I need to close my legs when I sit. I need to sit, uh, talk a particular way so as to not draw attention to myself, but also to protect myself from any of the unwanted attention. So subsequently, these uh, these radio hosts were fired. Um, so it was three three guys that were fired from the radio station, and. This was really interesting to me. So a Facebook user comments under the article saying, there's a lot of hypocrisy running in, into the Kenyan media boardrooms. For how long will we castigate others when we still have underlying issues to be addressed? These guys just express their concerns over a rocketing moral standard in our society. It's time we start pulling the bulls by the horns and desist from ostrich behavior of burying our heads whenever real and pertinent issues are raised. Our girls have decided to decay in moral in morals and are now clinging on to sympathy from all corners once they have misbehaved. The trio just echoed what exactly is ailing society. So I didn't, I didn't um, care too much to edit this person's uh, comments and I don't think I own that service. But what I did was actually just look at some of the keywords that are being used here. So we still have underlying issues to be addressed. Uh, moral standards in our society, real and pertinent issues are raised. Our girls um, have decided to decay in morals and are now clinging from uh, cl clinging on sympathy from all corners once they have misbehaved. The trio just echoed exactly what is ailing in our society. So what struck me is that this is really interesting because 
the person that made this comment is is they seem to be coming with a lot of confidence as in they're very, very sure of what they're saying. And, you know, they're talking about moral standards and the, and the issue, but really what they're doing is victim blaming. And I think what this comment in particular points to is the normalization of uh, the policing of people's bodies, but also normalizing abuse uh, by, by victim blaming and by blaming those who are not um, alleged uh, and are not supposedly acting the way they're supposed to behave, right? So I thought that was really interesting. And in um in in another project, we were looking at sort of uh, gender-based violence and discrimination, but really how the media reports on these issues. So some of the phrases I found, for instance, in cases where women uh, fight back or protect themselves against the abusive partners would be journalists who supposedly should know better uh, calling people, uh, labeling people Black Widow, Lady Macbeth, Babyface Killer, Murdered Girlfriends, Family. So again, there you see sort of the, the focus is on the victim or the survivor as opposed to the perpetrator. So there's a hyper visibility of Whenever we see these cases in the news, we see a hyper visibility of the victim and you know the details of what they went through, but not not so much about the actual perpetrator. And I think that's a bit of a problem. Um, we see things like um, abused murderers. So now you've taken the you know you've, you've you've taken the power into your own hands and maybe defended yourself against in a situation where it was a matter of uh, the woman or the person that is abusing her. And you still get this, this very kind of biased, stigmatizing uh, type of reportage. So these are just some of the observations I've been making. Um, and then, you know, I think in the age of, uh, there's, there's a huge interest in solutions journalism right now and constructive journalism. And one of the things that I think is really important for the media is to look at solutions. And I think in a way, well, very much so. We, uh, when AWM News was launched, um, Dr. MC had come with this vision that AWM News focuses on African women and media. And initially, it mainly just focused on um, African women media practitioners. But when you look at the role of media, and the role of African women media practitioners, a lot of what we're talking about and reporting on are issues that we live with every day. These are issues that we faced. And so we see a lot of these stories on media and sexual harassment, media and gender-based violence, uh, media and, and um, reporting protests and the type of jeopardy that uh, female and gender non-conforming bodies face in these kinds of situations. And so, the, the scope has broadened a little bit more to look at pro to, to look at sort of creating a, a body of media work that looks at African women, but also in a very uh, gender sensitive way. So for instance, we've got some of the articles that we've published um, end media bias against women in politics. So we're speaking about women in politics, but we're also looking at the role of media there. Um, another one was how our simple system ended past the wars. So this particular article doesn't seem like your typical um, addressing of gender-based violence or, or violence against women and just viol gendered violence in, 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 in actuality. But what's really interesting is that we see the role of women in, in ending these past the wars uh, because they had gotten quite intense. You know, it was very intense and uh, very dangerous for not just the communities that are, um, not just the women in the communities, but the entire community as a whole. So these kinds of articles sort of start to point towards the importance of telling, telling the women in media story in different ways and telling the role, um, telling the story of the roles that women play in leadership in their communities and as media, as media leaders um, in sort of addressing and changing the narrative around uh, gendered violence. Another one is on campaign trail, women issues remain unspoken. So again, we're highlighting the, 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 the sort of invisibility of women issues and you know, it, I think I think it's just it's so poignant that Awim's um, Awim's motto is uh, 
be visible to inspire. And we don't actually think about what that means until you look at the headlines, like the ones I spoke about, uh, murdered, uh, abused murderer, blue-eyed killer, and headlines like that. We don't really think about what exactly that says about women because those phrases sort of seem benign when in fact they're not and they're actually adding and contributing to rape culture and the, the culture of just gendered violence. And we've also got victim tropes still common in coverage of people, persons with disabilities. Again, we're looking at an intersection of of struggles, um, an intersection of uh, oppression, and that women, gender non-conforming people, children, people with disabilities, um, and, and anyone really who falls outside of that heteronormative patriarchal masculinity. And then we've also got articles like this one, a photo essay, Love Lockdown by Andy Corsi. And this article is about uh, a queer woman telling her story as a, as a queer woman living in South Africa and how being with her partner in public has always, it always rouses, um, you know, very negative interest. And I think with, with photo essays like this, you start to see how we can solve the issue of representation. So as much as she talks about the different types of violence that they experience on different levels, so physical, verbal, um, and sometimes um, emotional emotional violence from, from strangers in public, just because of the, the sort of body they, uh, they, 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 they assume. So these kinds of stories then start to shift the narrative a little bit. You start to look into the, 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 the lives of these people and it's in a way, in a way demystifies, you know, the, 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 the identity of a queer couple. Whereas in the streets, you know, what they talk about in this article, you see a lot of, you know, there's a, the, the people are basically agreeing that um, as lesbian women need to be correctively um, abused um, in order to change the orientation, but it doesn't work like that. So, and then in another article, we've got equal representation, still a dream for women in Uganda. So this is really just looking at some of the ways that uh, our women in particular has responded to this, um, to this need to change the narrative around uh, violence against women and gendered violence. And as Adele was saying in the video that you just saw, it's very important that um, journalists, media producers, media leaders attend constantly gender sensitivity training. Because I think what happens is oftentimes people go into a training or they sign up for a short course and you've done it once and you're like, great, now I know what to do. But sensitization, just, just as I said in the beginning, like growing up, you learn these things. And to reverse that, we need to be constantly sensitizing ourselves to the gender issues and how to um, report and develop policies that protect and address gendered violence in the workplace. So again, AWIM has responded to that uh, with uh, AWIM learning. So for example, as you can see, one of the courses here is reporting on women's rights, and then there's also developing internal gender policies. Um, and then I just want to say as a sort of a final, a final, I, I, almost as a call to action, um, this is from a piece that I, I wrote earlier this year, and I'm just going to read some of it. Some of humanity's most devastating injustices have been overcome by movements that have a strong unifying voice. From South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle to America's civil rights movement, people all over the world have fought continuously for justice at multiple levels of society. And while women and gender non-conforming people have contributed significantly to the gains of the racial liberation movement, their plight remains largely underappreciated. But if we have learned anything from the ongoing struggles for social justice, perhaps the movement for gender justice needs to be both coordinated at a global level and across intersectional contexts. And I think this is really important because if we're speaking about, um, you know, with the with the with the UN gender 
generation equality campaign, we are talking about a global movement, a movement that is really going to speak to gender-based violence, um, uh, gender discrimination across a global context. And I think that's the most impactful way to, to create change, to be coordinated, to be intersectional, and to be communicating with as many people as possible and encouraging one another as a network of people that are committed to one common goal, and that is a generation that is equal and fair. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to my first panelist. Um, first up, we have Charity Munga, who is a journalist from Times of Zambia, and she will just be talking through some of the work that she's been doing, um, reporting on, on, on violence against women and public perception. Charity, are you on mute? Am I still on mute? No, that's fine, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so as I was saying earlier, I was saying that my name is Charity Monga. I'm from uh, Times of Zambia, in Zambia. I live in Lusaka. And I'll just be talking to you on the role of the media in reporting violence against women. Uh, so I'll start with uh, defining what this violence is about. What is violence against women? Because I, I think as we, uh, journalists, we need to understand what violence against women consists of. So it has been defined as any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm, or any form of suffering to women. Uh, this type of uh, violence includes threats uh, such as um, coercion, arbitrary deprivation of liberty, and um, some of it even occurs in public or private life. So this violence against women is one of the most shameful human rights violation. Uh, this is because it knows no boundaries and uh, or even geography or culture or it can attack any form of women, even uh, the most successful women. So we are taught that as long as this type of violence continues, we cannot claim to be making any real progress towards equality, development and peace. So um, at this stage, this is where the media comes in. Um, the media has the potential to play a very significant role in changing um, these perceptions about gender-based violence that uh, in turn can help stimulate a move for change. So this is where as reporters, we come in to change this narrative about violence against women. So uh, as journalists, I think we need to understand also the types of uh, GBV that are there, the types of violence against women. So some of the types of violence are psychological, uh, coercion, verbal insulting, and uh, similar behavior, which uh, may impair a woman's mental health. Uh, other types of uh, violence against women involve stalking, which has uh, uh, any threatening conduct that makes a woman fear for her safety. There's also sexual violence, there's also economic violence. So these are the types of G GBV. In some countries, there's also genital mutilation, post abortion, post marriage, and also, uh, which are also forms of violence against women. Uh, the, the one that has, uh, is the latest is uh, cyber violence. 
this type of violence is characterized by threats and insults shared across social media platforms. I know many of us here have got social media accounts, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, we've seen how a lot of people are bullied uh, via cyber, the, the, the digital media. The common perpetrators of violence are current or former partners and uh, fathers. The most common type of violence suffered by women is psychological violence and violence that is both physical and psychological. So um, there have also been some myths about this GBV, um, which uh, concerns women, which involves violence against women. And some of these myths that need to be demystified, uh, things like violence starts with a punch. So this is not true. Or well, someone can be planned, can be, can, can start uh, bio, their violent acts, even through the words they use, even just through the way they treat their partner or, or their child. You can be able to tell, to say, this is an act of violence. It's not just about punching someone. Another myth is that uh, the purpose of gender-based violence is to keep a specific group in, in an inferior position. Now, this is not true. And um, another one is that violence is physical, uh, is only physical and sexual abuse uh, and sexual violence. As we've already explained above, we've seen that violence is not just about uh, physical violence or sexual violence. There's more to it. There's psychological violence as well. Um, and then um, most of us in our different cultures learned that women uh, are sometimes responsible for provoking violence. Uh, some people even think that uh, a woman got what she deserves uh, is more or less uh, accepted in, in our societies. Some people think that women actually provoke men for them to get that kind of violence against them. So that is just a myth. Um, some people even think that uh, women start these types of violence so that they are rewarded at, at the end, so that they, they are given some, some money. But we've also come to learn that this is not true. Um, so uh, another myth is that women um, put up with abusers, they, they choose to put up with abusers, but uh, more often than not, that is uh, also not true. Some key points that we need to note uh, are that women and girls are subjected to different forms of violence every day. And this has become worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a lot of reports have pointed out that uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an alarming rise in gender-based violence. And crimes such as rape, molestation, dowry, deaths, domestic abuse, and cyber crimes have all gone up. Research has also shown that responsible media reporting can mitigate the risk of GBV, especially against women. Media reporting has also revealed that reporting about violence against women tends to be sensationalistic. The more brutal, the more appealing. So some of uh, other key points are that if women are portrayed only as victims, it will exacerbate their victimization and send a message that they are weak and powerless and that it is best for them to endure that kind of violence silently. So... Um, The media needs to know that physical and sexual violence are not the only types of violence against women and neither is domestic violence. Okay, this one was mentioned up there. Then um, another key point to note is that portraying women only as victims in the media, as their, their victimization. This one has also been pointed out in the previous slide. So, um, um, to balanced media reporting of violence against women. 
So as journalists, um, um, we need to ensure balanced reporting of violence against women. And in this case, we've been called upon to avoid the following. Uh, number one is mentioning, identifying details of the victim. Uh, this, uh, these details include the victim's age or occupation. Then we've also been called to, on to avoid mentioning the locations that where the incident happened, such as uh, an abandoned building, an old warehouse, uh, then we've also been um, advised against uh, photographing the location of uh, this, the, or, or rather the scene of where the, this kind of violence took place. Then we, we've also been advised against description of the steps involved in crime, such as he lured the woman on the pretext of marriage, going in all those things, um, that's what we, we should avoid. And we should also avoid mentioning the, these details in the report as they can contribute to the victim being shamed. And then it will also provide clues to perpetrators. Um, so as we change the narrative as a media, we are being, we are being called upon to instead um, focus our reports on providing support service details, such as the hotlines where a, a woman can report such a crime, the shelters where they can obtain um, assistance, and the crisis centers where they, can, uh, where they can get help and draw attention towards positive stories of resilience and empowerment as survivors often act as agents of change. Yeah, so we should dwell more on positive stories of resilience and empowerment. Um, then we've also been called upon as a media to place pr prominent reports on the front pages of our, of our articles or of our, our, um, uh, our publications. So this should, uh, these placements help us to build awareness about GBV. Then we should also prioritize survivors' safety, right to dignity, confidentiality, protection from retribution or harm, as we've already explained in the previous slide. Uh, we should counteract the myths and our outdated attitudes. So instead of promoting the myths about violence against women, let us counter them and provide uh, the truth. And uh, in reporting violence against women, we should always remember to follow uh, country-specific media guidelines for sensitive reporting of GBV and crimes. And um, we should mention about the consequences to the perpetrators of violence. These perpetrators need to know that uh, engaging in such acts doesn't just end at it, but there are also consequences. And, um, I'll move on to the next slide. Then um, strategies to promote media role in preventing violence against women. Uh, there is need for a collaborative approach between the government, media, and health professionals that takes into account the barriers and perspectives of the media. We need to make responsible media reporting of GBV, GBV a mandatory part of the training curriculum for journalists and air teachers. Then uh, there's also need for television channels to consider hosting periodic talk shows or interviews with experts on various aspects of gender-based violence and crimes against women. Other strategies are placement of content pertaining to violence against women in uh, strategic places. That's most like as mentioned in the previous slide, um, our front pages. Then. Um, this content should be made significantly more visible in the media. Then um, we should not use violence against women, issues of violence against women to boost our circulations. 
and then we should avoid sensationalistic headlines as already explained in the previous um, uh, slides. Uh, languages such as Lusaka, Lusaka Mada, someone has killed his prostitute sister, or, uh, he beat his prostitute mother, or when love is shown with an axe, or because of jealousy, a 35-year-old slaughtered his wife with a knife, uh, these ones should be avoided as, at all costs because they justify the, viol the violence. So as media, as we try to change the narrative, please let's bear in mind that such kind of headlines only legitimize the, uh, legitimize the, the violence. Um, um, then in news ideas that we can develop on violence against women. Uh, these are um, continued monitoring of the work of relevant institutions in ending violence against women. Um, we can try and find out why only a small number of cases uh, end up in court and usually what is the judicial outcome of such cases. Then uh, we should also follow up how, how these cases have been tried and what the court judgment is. Then we can also look out for the centers for social work and find out what they are doing and how much they are helping women who lived or continue to live in violence, in violent situations. Uh, we can also find out um, the economic, uh, to what extent the economy influences the prevalence of domestic violence. And if there are, any identifiable trends. Other ideas we can follow up are to find out if economically independent women are less likely to face violent situations. So in conclusion, um, we find that the media is one of the most important socialized influences in people's lives. And uh, negative and stereotypical images of women in the media and the ways in which the media reports gender based violence contributes to the acceptance of gender based violence. So the call is now on us as the media, as the journalists, to inform people the understanding of issues, especially on the issue of eliminating violence against women. Um, that is all from me. Thank you so much. So I'll stop sharing as I hand over to the facilitator. Thank you. Thank you so much for that charity. Um, just a little housekeeping. What we're gonna do is we're gonna hear from the rest of the panelists first, and then we'll move into a short conversation uh, Q and A um, that I'll post to you. And then we'll break for uh, the breakout rooms and then come back and report back and before we close. So next we have Claret Adiambo uh, from Ghetto Radio Kenya and Claret is gonna tell us how to make this very interesting for young people. Hello, hi everyone. Hi Claret. Oh, hello, hi. Hi, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a bit nervous, but uh, because this is, I must say this is one of the biggest platforms I've ever had to grace. So you understand if I stumble and I mumble, but I know I won't fall because I know I have some very strong ladies who will hold my hands here. I'm seeing somebody's hand up. Is it a question? Oh, okay, fine, all right, okay. Anyway, so my name is Clara Chadiambo. I am a journalist. Uh, I work with Ghetto Radio. Ghetto Radio is a station that broadcasts in Nairobi. So I'm going to try to start sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, can you guys see it? I need, I need like a- Yes, we can, answer. we can. Okay, okay, anyway. So like I said, my name is Claret. I'm a journalist at Ghetto Radio. Ghetto Radio broadcasts in uh, Nairobi. Its main target audience uh, are the youth, youthful people, and of course, um, in urban in urban slums. 
So today I'm supposed to be talking about um, how we can use social media, how journalists can use social media to change the narrative on violence against women. So I must say that as a journalist, I find this topic a bit interesting since I work in a, in a traditional media that is radio. And then there is this emerging social media that we have had to em embrace. So it has come, I must say, um, social media has come with a lot of blessings. And at the same time, it has come with some, some challenges. I would love to call them challenges. But as journalists, we are journalists. We are supposed to be embracing and uh, at least uh, learning and navigating through some of the challenges that are thrust upon us in our, in our lines of duty. So we'll start by introduction. Uh, probably name some of the forms of violence that uh, are meted against women on social media. The first one I would go to is personification also known as identity theft. The thing with personification and identity theft on social media, it happens in a way that someone comes up, creates a social media account with your name, your photos, your details, and some of these guys are always updated. Then they start posting stuff that don't actually resonate with you, stuff that put you, that put you in tricky positions, that, that make that attract violence against specific women. So that is one of the forms and, and shapes that violence against women on social media comes. There is also cyber stalking. Cyber stalking is where, um, I, I believe so, those of us on so, social media, so many people here, at least almost 99% or 90 have, uh, have had stalkers in their lives, especially in social media. People look at this as something very, very small, but it is actually not small because cyber stalkers in most instances, in some instances, have turned into physical perpetrators of violence. The thing with cyber stalkers, they don't only stop their violence on social media. They can stalk you to your homes. We've had instances where women have been killed by people who've been stalking them on cyber. We also have this other form of defamation and hate speech. Uh, I think most of us are very familiar with defamation and hate, hate speech. We, we, we know we all have haters in our lives. And the problem with social media, you attract haters whom you don't even know, people who don't even understand what you do, and people do, who don't even know what the values that you stand for. We also have trolls. Uh, the thing about trolling is that most of us have have become we are victims of trolls. How we have also perpetrated this act of of violence against women on, on on social media. It's a form of violence against women, and then we have public shaming, public shaming, defamation, and hate speech are, are, are almost are almost similar. Then we have hacking and financial crimes. Nudes coming. I would combine hacking and nudes coming, nudes slash, slash coming, because um, this is the mantra that I have. My personal, my personal mantra: Don't ever take nudes, because if you need to identify, if you need to admire your body, you need to embrace your scars, you need to mark your milestones. Probably you are losing weight. You want to admire what has come do it probably in a private room in a mirror do everything but don't take nudes on your phone you see the problem the thing with these gadgets that you use we might lose them anytime you might want to take your nudes probably to keep them in your phone for your own personal consumptions and personal reasons but the problem with this with this with these nudes is that they often they can easily get into somebody else's hands what happens if you put nudes in your in your, lap, in your laptop, probably, let's say, and your laptop breaks down, you need to take it to a technician. The technician gets access to your, to your nudes and starts scamming you. People don't know that we often feel like ashamed about this. Most people don't talk about it, but it is a form of violence that has affected so many women and it's actually still going on. It's even, it's even shameful and it's even worrying that we are talking about this against a backdrop of a very, 
a very popular politician doing this to another powerful uh, politician here in Kenya and specifically in Nairobi. The other form of probably violence against women that we know is uh, deep fake. Deep fake is a bit technical. This is a situation where someone takes a video, kind of changes the face to look like clarets. So you look at the video, you say, I've never been in this position. But if you, if you look at the face, this is actually claret. And they start to public shame you. And, and they use it to public shame you or to probably to, to portray you in an image that you wouldn't want to be portrayed in. We also have the other, the other form that is also very prominent, the other form of violence that is very prominent that is being perpetrated, that is being meted upon women on social media is re revenge porn. Revenge porn. The unfortunate thing about revenge porns is that it is done. It is done by your former lovers, your former partners, uh, who took videos of you when you are having some intimate moments, and then starts uh, once you break up, they they use them against you to public shame you, to portray you as a slut, probably. So those are some of the of, of the few examples of violence against women that is actual violence against women being conducted on social media. So my next slide is going to talk about so how do we unknowingly participate on violence against women online? After we've known about the different forms and shapes of types of vo online violence on social media meted against women, we also need to check ourselves. Because sometimes, this is what I say, sometimes we participate on these violence, on these acts of violence against women on social media unknowingly. And the most prominent and probably most popular act of violence against women that we participate in is, is silence. Many people don't know it, but silence is a lot of things. When you see someone share content that has violence against women on social media and you keep quiet, probably because you, you want to be politically correct or you don't want to be called names. Uh, because people who talk about violence against women, uh, you must agree with me, most of us are, are called, we are called to toxic feminists. They're giving us all sorts of names. I, for example, speak about gender, gender violence and gender sensitive reporting in my office so much, my, my colleagues tell me to open an NGO to start advocating for those, for those rights. But, but I'm like, I oh, know, there already is enough platform for me to do these things. So we don't need to keep silent. The point is we don't need to, to keep quiet. We need to speak up. When you see someone share content that is that has uh, that has that is meeting violence on a woman or any other person, you need to call them out in a way that is educative, in a way that is authoritative, in a way that is going to tell them that what you're doing is wrong, and this can actually take you to court or take you to jail. So there, and the other form of the, the other action or act that we do probably on social media that you don't know kind of facilitates violence against women is liking and forwarding content with violence against women. I will talk about liking. You know what happens on, on Facebook? Facebook posts uh, reach and are judged by the number of likes that you get. So when you, when you put, when you like a content on Facebook that has, that actually, uh, that has violence, you kind of optimize the, that content. You make, it, you make it more accessible to, make, to more people. So hence, you are exposing this, uh, this victim in this content to violence to more social media users. The other thing is, um, that is so common is that the WhatsApp sharing, the forwarding of content. So many of us have forwarded content that has violence against women uh, most of us have done it, I would say, unknowingly with no ill intentions. 
But the repercussion is this victim or the person in this content has been exposed to violence. The person in this content that probably you're sharing, you're sending it to, uh, is going to face trolls, is going to be trolled, is going to be public shamed from your innocent action. This is what I do when I get, you know, at times we, we are in so many WhatsApp uh, pages, we don't have control over what gets into those pages, the kind of content that gets into those pages. But this is what I personally do when I see someone sharing content that has violence against women, I first delete everything so I don't mistakenly share it or I don't get tempted to send it to someone to have a look at it. And then the next thing is educate this person because most of we assume that people are aware of, of the different forms of violence against women, that people are aware of gender sensitive reporting but just recently, I realized so many of us have been making so many mistakes and learning is a progress. We, don't, we should never assume that this person is aware of their act. If it's possible, you can side chat these people, tell them, you see, this content you're sharing is not right. You should at least, you should, this is what you're exposing this person to. I will give you an example of, of the of the COVID-19, the COVID-19 patient, the first COVID-19 patient uh, in Kenya, the lady and the guy, there were two, the first and the second. Uh, the government had all the good intentions of sharing the story of this lady and sharing the, and telling everyone the success story. But then again, just a second. <laughs> Yeah, the government held, had all the good intentions, but what happened to this lady as it, she was trolled just for coming out and saying, hey, I had COVID and I am now fully recovered. This thing is not a, a death sentence. She was trolled, her nudes were shared online, and she got all forms and all manner of violence meted against her. While on the other side, the guy didn't, didn't actually get any, any other form of, of violence. And the people who are sharing, who are forwarding this content, her nudes, people who are sharing this violent content, some were journalists, some were people we thought understood, very, understood uh, things, understood uh, gender sensitive reporting, understood stuff with regards to violence against women. And then the other way that we probably participate in violence against women unknowingly is uh, we are, if you are on Twitter, you have, I, I believe you've come across this famous phrase, retweets are not endorsements. My personal opinion, I, have a, I, act, I, I stand to be corrected. You can, you can chat me up on anything or, or even on this statement because I don't think I would retweet something that I don't agree with. Yeah. If you if you if you're on Twitter and you see content, when I retweet it, that means I am sharing it back to my followers for my followers to see. And when you, it, it doesn't matter your intention. If it is content that has violence against women, it is content that prob probably you don't agree with. You become a perpetrator. So correct correct me is if I'm wrong, but that is my personal opinion on on Twitter. So then again, how do we prevent, after we've known all these forms of violence against women that, has, that are being perpetrated on social media, and we have also checked ourselves and we know how we probably contribute to them, how do we prevent some of these social media attacks on, on the people whose stories we tell and even I'm sorry, on the people whose stories we tell and even, and even us advocates, people who are advocating against violence against women. So the first thing you first you need to do on your social media page is you need to review your social media pro profile. Because online violence perpetrators often target close family members, relatives, and to some extent, your, your employers. Facebook has this, when you go to your Facebook profile, if you go to settings, it has this long list of things that it wants you to fill up. It, it even gives you the option of, of tagging who you are, 
who your partner is, who your husband is, or who your or who your wife is, or whom you're engaged to, and even your family tree. So I'd advise people to try and limit some of the information they give, they put up on their profile pages. At least you only need uh, the most important thing is is information with about you and probably what you do, because. Because perpetrators of this violence against uh, against women or, or perpetrators of any forms of violence often hit or often attack often attack your close family members. So you need to be at least careful on what you put up on your profile or what you say on your profile or what you share on your timelines. The other way to actually prevent this is by reviewing your privacy options on your social media platform. I will talk about Facebook. Facebook gives, um, I, I am more, I spend most of my time on Facebook than any other uh, than any other platform, but I believe all others are very relevant depending on where your strength is or where you have the biggest following. So uh, Facebook gives this setting where you can, um, you can stop people from posting any, uh, uh, you can stop any Tom, Dick and Harry from accessing your timeline, i.e. posting your, your birthday, posting your, uh, just, just feeling uh, like uh, putting any stuff, any information on your timeline, or even tagging you, actually. Even tagging you in posts, you can, you have, Facebook provides that setting, and it also, and Twitter also has the provision where you can you can control who replies to your tweets. You can also control who who sees your tweets. You can block trolls. All these social media platforms, at least the three that I'm very familiar with, that is Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, completely gives you this privilege of at least reviewing your privacy option. Facebook has gone even a notch higher of 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 giving you the option of when you put up a post, you control who who the post reaches to. You can block a few people, certain certain people that you probably know troll everything that you say, or people you believe don't agree with what you say. Or you can also completely block trolls from your social media pages. It is your social media account. It is your page, so you can. If you don't agree with someone, you don't you don't agree with the opinion, please feel free to block them so they don't drain the energy from you or they don't they don't pull you down. The other way you need you can actually prevent these attacks. One thing I know about about hate mongers and uh, haters and trolls is that they hate the truth. These people hate the truth. Um, because trolls and hate mongers are people who just sit and, and, and come up with, with some propaganda against you. They come up with some very funny figures and, 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 and want to make people believe that this is actually the truth. So when you equip yourself, you need to equip yourself with online fact-checking tools. They are so many. You see, Facebook and Twitter came with all these blessings at the same time it came with all these challenges. But then again, tools have also come up that will enable you to actually check if if this tweet is actually true or if this tweet originally came from this from this account so these are some of the fact checking tools okay yes can you yeah sorry for it. can i just ask you to wrap up because we're running out of time okay yeah um, yeah i'm almost i'm almost finishing sure. I, I just have two slides to finish yeah so I would, I would, I'm not going to mention all of them. We have all these fact-checking tools that you need to equip yourself with. Uh, we have Africa Check, we have PESA Check, we have uh, Hoxi. So you need to equip yourself with some of these tools so that you don't, you, you, you can always call them out and you can always check them. Google has reverse image, we have Yandex. You can use them to at least uh, to at least check on some of these deep fake videos that have that people these hate mongers used to come up with to 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 troll or to create violence. So then the other and probably the final thing you need to do you need to speak out you need to call out the perpetrators of these 
platforms, you need to report them to the relevant authorities, the police, and you also need you can also report them to the to the various social media companies. As in, if it's Facebook, they have a reporting platform where you can report accounts and they disable them. And you can also demand accountability and above all, uphold professionalism. But when overwhelmed, you can always seek professional advice, talk to organizations, talk to your friends, talk to your voices, to your bosses, don't keep quiet, speak up. I think that's it, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Clarette. Um, I think it was very insightful, especially talking about how to safeguard ourselves from all of these unknown threats or less known threats. Um, next, we have Zanel M. Tembu from SWIFT. Uh, SWIFT is South African, I mean, Sisters Working in Film and Television, and it's a South African organization. Zanele, take it away. So, are you able to, Samaya? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Now. Okay. Are you able to, to share the presentation on your end? Uh, sure, let me pull it up. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Charity and Claret, for your presentation. There's so many things that I've taken away. Um, just to give you context in terms of what I'm about to present, in my previous life, I was uh, a broadcaster working for two local television channels in, in, in here in South Africa, ETV, and I also worked for, a, for Newsroom Africa. I am more of a content creator um, and not a journalist. And what Swift decided to do was that we, we wanted to turn the spotlight onto the women um, that are actually reporting and creating the content that we see on, in the media. Because um, we too are affected by what is happening. Yes, we're reporting on these things. Yes, we're telling stories about what is happening uh, in terms of violence against women. But we want to see how can we be empowered as well because we're experiencing the same violence the same sexual harassment, and how can we then be empowered as women working in this space? And our hope is that when we're done with this presentation that we can really sh then share ideas in terms of how do we um, thrive as women working in this industry? Because SWIFT has done a lot of work to ensure that we are empowered to be able to do the work that we are doing. We can move on to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, so just to give you a bit of background about SWIFT, we are a nonprofit that is com uh, committed to transforming the industry to a more equitable sector. Um, our industry is still very much white male dominated. And as women, particularly black women or women of color was literally still at the bottom of this totem pole. And uh, we really are advocating for equitable representation throughout the industry value chain that is in front of and behind the camera. We're advocating for pay parity and an end to the race and gender pay gap. And absolutely safe working environments free from sexual harassment and discrimination. In our efforts as, as SWIFT, um, we want to make sure that women can progress in the industry. Because as long as we have sexual harassment or violence against women, particularly within the industries that we work in, and I will speak specifically to the audiovisual sector, which I'm a part of, um, is that if we're not safe, we really cannot progress. We cannot thrive in these environments. We want to improve the work experiences for the women and the vulnerable groups. And this we believe will benefit the entire industry 
uh, and it and it is the responsibility of everyone not just the women and when i say everyone i'm talking about the media uh, our who are really our employers because they pay us to create the content that we end up seeing on television the funders of the content um we're also you know the men that are in our lives um as south africans uh, what uh, charity and uh, was talking about earlier and they need to be part of the solution and so it's not just our responsibility and we felt then that before we can do anything before we can develop help develop the skills or while we're doing this actually it is important for us to then prioritize educating and creating awareness and actively advocating against sexual harassment uh, for women in our industry. So in terms of what we have done, um, we have created a, a number of um, interventions and a number of programs that we have introduced. And we've taken these measures and the first one being that that's not okay campaign. And this campaign is public service awareness um, videos that we have created that are inspired by real life uh, experiences of women working in, in, the, in, in this industry because often when we're working, sometimes we're not sure whether what we're experiencing is sexual harassment or not, because that's what is really prevalent in, in, in this industry. Whether that sexual harassment is verbal, nonverbal, you know, there's a, there's a lot of quid pro quo in our industry. If you want to make it, you have to sleep with the director or the producer. I mean, we've seen it not just here in South Africa, but the world over. We've, we've seen how this impacts on women. So these videos were specifically to educate, first and foremost, the women that are working in the industry so that they do not doubt what they are experiencing. They do not question what they're experiencing. And they know for sure, without any doubt, that I have just experienced sexual harassment. So we created these videos. The videos um, are available on our website and uh, can be shared with, with anyone that you can then use in your own platforms as workers as well. And our efforts were actually driven mainly because the majority of us that work in this industry are freelancers. We therefore do not enjoy the protection uh, as employees that people that are employed you know, enjoy under the Labor Relations Act or employment equity for that matter. We don't uh, have those protections and therefore we do not have recourse uh, where we can go maybe to the CCMA conciliation uh, um, mediation, uh, now I, I'm, I'm missing it up, but the CCMA where we can get relief when we have complaints. So we started with compiling or putting together a code of good practice for the reasons that I've alluded to, that we do not have the protections of Employment Equity or the Labor Relations Act, that this code on handling sexual harassment in the workplace, while it is in informed by the Employment Equity Act, it specifically speaks to freelancers in the, in the industry, because those are the most vulnerable in our industry. And we've seen all over the media how when women come out and speak about sexual harassment, they are then uh, sidelined, you know, they, they don't get jobs and, and they're further victimized um, because of speaking out. So the code, we wanted to make sure that it provides the protection against sexual harassment for all workers, for uh, independent contractors that come onto sets, clients, our service providers, and covers freelancers most importantly, and that it is designed and written in such a way that it speaks specifically to freelancers. And we, in, in the work that we have done, we have collaborated with Tokiso, which is an alternate dispute resolution, an independent alternate dispute resolution company, and who are lawyers that specifically specialize in sexual harassment. And uh, they, this, um, code was informed by the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination act which is what really can protect us because the others as i've mentioned the other uh, laws are, do not really protect us because we're not deemed to be employees 
Uh, the code explains what sexual harassment is, and it outlines the responsibility of the, of the production company, the company that is employing uh, us to work on those sets. And their responsibility is to provide a safe and respectful workplace. What shouldn't happen, and they are able to, they should then have this code in the workplace so that everyone that is working on that production is aware of their behavior, their actions, and, and what they say on those sets. So what we can do as SWIFT is that we request all production companies to do the right thing and to adopt the code. And this includes um, including this contract, or I mean this code on each and every person's uh, contract when they come onto a production. We want to ensure that this code is generally distributed and made available. I mean, our powers as SWIFT are limited. Uh, however, we are working with funders specifically and broadcasters because they are really the ones that pay for the productions that we, we produce for them that we eventually see on air, that they have the power um, to stop what is happening by insisting that each and every production or production company that they commission or they fund includes this code, because this is the only way that we can then begin to protect the freelancers that are, are working in the industry. If we can move please to the next uh, slide. What we've also done is that we have produced a booklet, um, which is the sexual harassment uh, guide. And this is, 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 a, is a booklet that helps us um, that are working in this, in this industry to know our rights and to know what we do and to know exactly what sexual harassment looks like, how it presents our, uh, itself um, and, and, and be able to, uh, and to then know how to report when we experience incidents of, of, of sexual harassment in, in the workplace. Um, you know, with um, the, the, the code it's itself, it has been adopted. The good thing is that the code has now been adopted by a number of organizations, by government um, as specifically and government agencies like the National Film and Video Foundation, the SABC, it has been, um, oh, sorry about that. Did I jump all over the place? Apologies about that. Um, okay. So it has been adopted uh, by broadcasters, it's been adopted by funders. And we've outlined who has adopted it, uh, which is the department, uh, the minister has signed a pledge to support the work that is being done to protect the workers um, in, in the industry. The National Film and Video Foundation, which is an agency of government. Um, you can go back to the slide that you had earlier. Uh, I, I seem to have put things out of order uh, for, I don't know, apologies on my end. The Gauteng Film Commission, these are the main funders in, 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 in our industry. And the industry itself has adopted this code. So we have a federation that covers the different um, uh, professional bodies within the industry. We as SWIFT are a member organization of SASFED, the South African Screen Federation, and the Federation then adopted this code so that each and every organization that belongs to the Federation can also then ensure that it, it implements the work that we are doing. The, the, the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, we have a reference group where SWIFT is, represents the interests of the women in the industry. And that reference group was as a result of a summit that was held to say that we need organization sitting around the table. Uh, I mean, we need industry sitting around the table with government, uh, you know, to inform government about what works for the industries and, and what doesn't work. And we sit on this forum as SWIFT to ensure that these type of initiatives are adopted. If we do not protect the women and vulnerable people in our organization, it impacts the work that we eventually, that everyone actually eventually enjoys on the screens uh, 
on our television sets and, and streaming platforms all over. We have been working with the SABC. The aim is that we work with the National Association of Broadcasters so that we are not going to each and every individual broadcaster in the country, but we go to the body that actually manages the broadcasters to ensure that this is done. Um, and that they, as the funders of the content, ensure that we are protected as reporters, we're protected as creators of the content. That really then generates the revenue for them, you know, that we need to be of good health, sound mind and body. Uh, otherwise, it, you know, the whole thing doesn't work. You can skip this one because I've spoken to. So other measures that we've taken is that we ran a pledge campaign with actors. I, I alluded to this earlier to say that we alone as women cannot change everything. We need the men in, so, in our societies to really work with us. So with actor spaces, we partner with some of our very famous actors that have large following to pledge that they will not sexually harass, that they will ensure that they report incidents of sexual harassment, that they will support us in the work that we are doing to end sexual harassment in the workplace. This was a very successful campaign which culminated in the pledge being taken at the South African Film and Television Awards where each one, each person that was attending that award actually stood up and took the pledge with us. And it created that awareness that we do really need to work towards ending the scourge in our society. We also, as an organization, offer sexual harassment workshops to production companies, and these workshops can be actually offered outside of our own industry. And we can collaborate even with media because we're all working in this environment to make sure that we are protected and we are, um, yeah, we're protected and that we can thrive. Yes, you can move to the next one. Um, thank you. So we, we, we do agree that awareness on its own and education is not enough. So in, in what we have then done, we can move to the next one is that we have then started because we know that, you know, yes, we're informed, we're empowered, we have this information, but what can we do about it? How can I then get protected because I cannot go to the CCMA? So we started as SWIFT this program, which is called the Safety Contact Officer Program. And it offers a remedy. It's a way of offering a remedy and recourse really for freelancers that are working. So the program, the Safety Contact Officer program is really preventive and risk management focused. And each production, our vision is that each production will then appoint the Safety Contact Officer to be on set so that whoever is working on that set or in that production office has a go-to to report to. But they're also there to really assist the production companies to manage the risk, to know what to do when incidents of sexual harassment occur. These SEOs are professionals, they are trained, they are social workers and, and they are also counselors. They are trained in psychosocial and counseling and they have also been trained in the legal framework um, and procedures relating to sexual harassment. They are custodians of the information. The reality is that as an organization, we do not have the capacity, neither do we have you know, the skills to deal with the, the, the reporting of sexual harassment that will come through to us. So these individuals are equipped to ensure that they, they uh, manage and refer uh, whatever cases come through to them. They are equipped to do the work and they can also, most importantly, they can ensure confidentiality, which is what has really deterred women in the past from coming out to report incidents of sexual, I mean, sexual harassment because you know, they are victimized. So we then um, did a pilot which ran from September 29th and where are we now? 2020 uh, to January 2021. And the uptake in the industry wasn't great, but we understand because of COVID and a lot of production companies were coming back into producing our industry. 
was really affected by COVID. So it took a long time for us to get back to work. So there were companies, seven production companies in total that responded to the call and they participated in this sexual harassment impact sessions, which are really aimed at educating about sexual harassment. You can't feign, uh, the, you know, uh, you can you can feign not knowing if <laughs> you, because simply because you say I don't have the information. So these sessions are very important. And then the, we had um, sessions with producers. The NFVF supported us in, in launching this. We even had students um, that we partnered with when they were launching their film on sexual harassment to talk more about the, the safety contact officer pilot because the, the missing link in the industry was where do we go to report? We can go to the, I think the last slide. So what we then found uh, out of this, which is why we, we want to now really launch this, the, this, this program nationwide and get the support for it is that is to, oh, sorry, go to the last, the, the previous one. Sure. Sorry, yeah. Zanella, can we just start wrapping up because we're having to yes, head this to is the, the last one. Okay. Uh, slide. Um, no, let me choose, yeah. So in terms of the next steps, it's to continue to provide the service of the SCOs. We are engaging stakeholders, which are outside of the industry to ensure that this um, um, SCO program is not a swift initiative, but it's adopted by the industry. And eventually it becomes almost like an ombud that deals with issues of sexual harassment, which we can then of course expand. Um, we, are, we want to engage with the media, everyone that's here and getting the message out there. We've done the work um, our, ourselves and it's just a matter of getting it out there. And of course, to make sure that this program works. Um, the la last slide. Um, and I'm going to wrap up now. And there are other interventions uh, that we are looking at, which is gender sensitivity training. We're also partnering with festivals to ensure that the work that is produced by women gets the center stage and it is exhib exhibited in order to grow the, uh, you know, an appreciation and, and an audience for, for the work itself. Um, definitely, we need a world that with no sexual harassment at all. And that is really the, the work that SWIFT is doing now um, is to ensure that we have a world without uh, sexual harassment. Thank you very much, um, Sunea and everyone. Thank you for that, Taneda. I think you guys are doing amazing work. I think it's very important for women to come together and say, we're not going to take this. And that's something we haven't really seen much of. Um, last but not least, we have Sunita Kamina from UN Women East and Southern African Regional Office. I will share your presentation, Sunita. Thanks so much, Sumeya, and greetings to everyone um, from UN Women East and Southern Africa Regional Office. We really also appreciate the continued energy to stay on the panel. We know it's been a series of um, intensive days and discussions, so we're really grateful for the time. What I'd like to do in building off of the great content and, and presentations and points highlighted by the previous panelists, and I'm grateful really to be on this, um, is to really highlight some attention to areas that we can focus on our attention. If we're thinking about how do we change the narrative, how do we really shift the story around ending violence against women and girls? We go to the next slide. So just to begin and to start with some interaction, we go to the next slide. Um, I'd like to ask everyone as media pro professionals in different capacities, when you hear the phrase violence against women and girls, what is the first image, phrase, feeling that comes to mind? And you can put it in, I'd invite you to put it in the chat box just to get a quick round of reflections of what, what is, you know, what comes to mind? What is our immediate reaction? Great if you can put some of those thoughts in the chat box. Again, there's no right or wrong. It's just about to get the temperature in the room around what do we, what comes to mind? So you see sexual violence. Thank you, Yamisi, for contributing that. It could be a feeling. It could be a pic, you know, an image, um, fear, voiceless, premature death.
woman slapped on her face. Yet again, this kind of continued what's happening, battered wives, unwanted advances, poor laws, law enforcement, sickening, bruises. So there's a lot of really um, you know, palpable connection to the, the, con the negative consequences of violence against women and girls. It's unsafe, and that's really real. Um, but what is also telling about these immediate reactions is that we don't immediately get a sense of the hope, the potential of a world, as um, Zanella was saying, that you know, we, did, we deserve and demand a world that's free of harassment, free of violence. And, and I think that's something also that is a space where, you know, as we're looking to, um, to change the narrative, a space that the media has a, has a really valuable and powerful role. So thank you for your contributions to that. And I do hope that, you know, when they will be moving towards that. So if we're thinking about, um, you know, why we're having these, you know, why these thoughts that come to mind are often so negative and so harmful, it's because that indeed the situation in the world is really alarming and it is, it is problematic. And that is why we need to change, right? We know that as we have more and more data on prevalence, the percentage of, of women um, and girls in the population that have experienced violence, we continue to see that one in three have experienced physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. We also know as um, our speakers have shared, as Charity was sharing earlier, that you know, often um, the perpetrators of violence are individuals that are known and close often to the, the person who is experiencing the violence. We also know that in Sub-Saharan Africa, that one in five women and girls have experienced violence in the previous 12 months when we look at the data available, which is higher than the global averages. So these are you know, concerning, concerning figures. If we go to the next slide. But at the same time, we also can take stock that as, you know, in the last, uh, as each year comes by and in the last decade, we do have um, and beyond, we have had growing commitments. Each year, there are more laws and policies, strategies, plans, and we have more evidence of what actually works to prevent violence from happening in the first place and, and what is needed to really provide a, a, you know, adequate support to survivors. And we've had some great examples on the panel today of some of those um, resources and initiatives. So in terms of what you know, the foundation that we have, we know that all countries across the continent have constitutional provisions that call for equality and non-discrimination. That's really important. We also know that almost all countries have ratified the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Again, almost all have provisions to protect against violence. And we also know that many countries have ratified the Maputo Protocol on the Rights of Women in Africa. It's also um, important to know that um, when we look at domestic violence legislation, only 27 countries, so the countries in blue, have actually put that in place. So you already see that the, the foundations and the laws are not fully covering um, the protections that, are, that they're meant to uphold. But it's also important to note that these, co these commitments already highlight the role of media. So for example, the Maputo Protocol um, requests media to eliminate stereotypes. Um, and, and other uh, discriminatory measures that perpetuate violence against women. We go to the next slide. In terms of the knowledge and, and what is changing in terms of trends, we also have greater evidence of what works to prevent violence. And this is just a snapshot of the different levels that interventions need to be addressing to really look at the root causes and, and of, of violence against women and girls, which is gender inequality and dis discrimination. And what this visual tells us is that we need to be working across levels, not just working on individual behavior change, but really thinking about the relationships and powers um, within families, within individual relationships, within the community and societal norms. And I think some of the interventions we heard today are reflecting those different areas of action. And when we think about the media, that also is something that we can use this to guide, you know, what what areas are we going to engage in? It's not just about the individual media professionals, but it's about the media houses, the systems, the, the policies. We go to the next slide. At the same time, so we have these commitments, we have greater evidence, but we know, and we have seen with COVID-19 that there has been a surge in, in this, what we call the shadow pandemic of violence against women and girls. 
Uh, most recently, UN Women came up with a report that looked at data from 13 different countries across regions and really highlighted the severity of this problem. So while we know one in three women have experienced violence in their lifetime, one in two would say in, in, with the COVID-19 pandemic would say they, they knew someone who had experienced violence in this period. We also can see, and I think this was highlighted earlier, that often you know, violence is, always, is not necessarily um, physical or leaves visible injuries, but at the same time, often what we see in the headlines or in reports focuses just on that one form of violence. And so that's, again, something for us to, to take with us as we look to how we're going to change the narrative. We go to the next slide. So in terms of where we are seeing some different interventions engaging the media on these issues, what we can see is that there are more and more trainings, opportunities for media, for media professionals, particularly for journalists, to learn about issues of gender equality, to learn about reporting on violence against women. But we also, it's important that we remember that, that again, it doesn't start or stop with the individual, that this is a systemic uh, problem that requires a systemic and a holistic, comprehensive uh, in, uh, intervention to respond. We know that there are now more networks of media personnel. Um, we have the, the, you know, as we heard from Zanelle with SWIFT, the amazing work and advocacy. So there are these great um, opportunities and entry points. And, I, and whether that's in policy measures, codes of conduct, standards, monitoring of the media. And now is an opportunity for us to say, okay, how do we build on this? How do we take this to scale and grow from this? We go to the next slide. The Global Media Monitoring Project has come up with reports on, on how um, issues of gender are covered in the media, and it's done every five years. The most recent report from 2020 highlighted, and just this is one piece of it, there's a, quite a, a, a valuable report, and I can put the link in the chat box, is that when the seven out of the nine stories, uh, out of 10, seven to nine out of the 10 stories that looked at issues of sexual harassment, rape, other forms of gender-based violence, they didn't um, challenge the gender inequality and stereotypes that really perpetuates this violence. So what happens is there might be continue, there might be re more reports on these issues, but they're not challenging the framing or the narrative that blames victims. That again, as we heard from um, you know in the previous uh, panelists, that really reinforces these harmful stereotypes. Um, we also know that that they're not they're not raising visibility of gender inequality as the root cause of this. So again, making it seem like about an individual problem or an individual incident. And this um, GIF at the side highlights kind of what that looks like in practice and how we need to actually change that, that writing um, in how violence against women is reported. Go to the next slide. When we look at um, gender inequality and diversity in the media, we can also see representation remains of challenge. We see that women um, as, a, as a group broadly remain a minority, but within that, it's often able-bodied, gender-conforming women who are visible. And that's not, rea that's not realistic in terms of representation of the population or the realities of individuals' experiences. And, and it's really important that we look at um, challenging that and being a, attentive um, to what are the platforms we can use to really create space for more diverse voices to be heard and seen in the media, in, in the different platforms we're in. So as we move forward, we, there are three kind of spaces that we could be looking at um, and working at different levels. And this brings together what we've heard from the different speakers, working to, and all of these support, you know, efforts to really change the social norms and behaviors that perpetuate violence. At the core of this is working to improve media content. There's different ways we can do this. Then there's also um, a level that we need to be looking at the policies and the institutions to promote gender equality within the sector. And then we also need to be thinking about what is that broader conducive environment and enabling environment in the legislation, in the policies, media related policies, but otherwise as well. Um, if we go into the next slide, and I know I'm jumping quickly because I want to give time for the breakout groups, um, just some examples of ways to support work in the regulatory framework in that enabling environment. There could be support for um, frameworks that look at how media reports, what it can report on violence against women. There could be engagement when the, there are national strategies being developed on violence against women, 
what is the role of media in those? Often we have different sectors involved. Media needs to be part of it. Similarly, when there are strategies around media development, what are, how are issues of violence being brought into that? There needs to be support for media monitoring, research analysis. Again, this is happening. The Women Who Makes the News, the Global Media Monitoring Project is one example of that. There are others. And being a watchdog, again, to really ensure that the media is um, serving a safe, in a safe and transparent way. If we move to the next slide. Okay, um, the role of the media in terms of, oh, I think I've skipped one, just really quickly um, on internal policy. So uh, we've heard already about some of the different areas that need to be addressed from representation and parity, looking at codes of conduct um, across different areas, as well as the investing in the training and capacity development at different different levels of media, so not just journalists, but really also those who are making decisions and making strategic choices about what is presented, what is invested in, in the media space. And then, of course, the safety of women journalists, which we've heard some uh, panelists touch upon. Finally, if we go to the next slide, in terms of media content and changing social norms, again, we've heard a little bit around how do we report, what do we report, um, and there's a lot of platforms for media to really um, engage in the space. So, you know, one of one air, kind of entry point is informing the public of issues of violence against women and girls, educating again that this is, you know, what are the root causes that it's not, not about an individual, it's actually a societal um, issue that needs to be addressed in that way. Raising awareness also via experts who are who is being brought in to speak about these issues. Are they the women's rights organizations, feminist organizations, networks that have been doing this work for decades? Or is it um, just, you know, who, who's giving space, who's not given space? Facilitating a platform for marginalized, excluded voices. Again, recognizing that, for example, women and girls with disabilities are twice as likely to get to be experiencing violence in many contexts. Where are their voices and, and where are they, are they seen in the media and given that space and platforms? Um, and then, you know, using edutainment initiatives, um, collaborations with different movies or ser you know, series to really also shape public opinions and the norms and change, again, continuing to challenge perceptions and stereotypes. Um, if we go to the next slide, I just will touch upon very quickly the Generation Equality um, Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence. So um, we heard Sumeya mention this at the beginning and we can share the link, but there are, you know, the Generation Equality Platform uh, Action Coalition identified four areas um, of interventions to accelerate progress on gender-based violence from ensuring that we have services for survivors, ensuring there's greater investments in prevention, um, ensuring that laws and policies are financed and implemented, and also continuing and increasing support to women's rights organizations because they have been at the forefront of this work over time and historically. So with that, there are ample opportunities and you can go to the final slide um, for media professionals, the sector to engage and really um, shift the narrative. And we really hope that um, through the conversations that we'll be having shortly, we can really start to brainstorm and explore further ways of collaborating. So this is just a, a picture from some of the conversations that took place as part of the generation equality um, preparations and some of the questions that we need to be exploring. And I thought it was a beautiful visual that reflects some of also the, the work of storytelling and the, the role of media. So. Um, thank you again for your time and look forward to the conversations. Thank you for that, Sunita. I think that was the perfect way to segue into our breakout rooms and we'll talk more um, about different ways that we can all contribute to Generation Equality's campaign, the objectives of the campaign. So we're going to take 10 minutes for breakout rooms and then come back to report.
Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you've all had uh, really good discussions in your breakout rooms. I think um, people are still coming back, Sumaya. If you just give it oh. another 10 seconds, okay. um, then everybody will be pushed back into the main room. Okay, I think we're all back. That was pretty brief. I'm sorry we had to cut it short, um, but hopefully you had great conversations. So may I over to you. Sure. Thanks. Um, thanks, MC. Uh, I hope everyone's had like really good conversations in your breakout rooms. So without further ado, I'm just gonna ask for breakout room number one to quickly report back. I think we'll give everyone about maximum one, a minute. One minute, yes. Yeah. Hi, colleagues. So uh, it's, it was just us, Claret, um, and I as co-facilitators of the breakout room one. And then we have a rapporteur. Um, I don't remember. I don't, I don't know if she's here. Her name is Nduta. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Wonderful. Can you just, uh, I will share the screen, this the slides, and then you can uh, re report back if you, yeah? I'm okay. sharing the slides. I hope you can see it and you I feel free to go ahead. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, my name is Nduta. I'll be the rapporteur for this uh, session. And um, one of the things that we discussed is the question, what would be some of the incentives for media houses to write extensive on violence against women? And the report we got is that uh, there is need for more sensitization, workshops and training so that we can make uh, uh, the journalists more aware about issues surrounding violence against women and how to report it. And an important thing that was said is that uh, it should target not only the journalists, but also media, uh, media managers, editors, and other gatekeepers within the newsroom system. The other point was to increase funding or rather have funding in terms of grants and sponsorships, uh, specifically on reporting on violence against women and gender-based violence so that uh, the stories that can get um, adequate attention, get the attention it's needed in terms of uh, airtime and all. The third point is uh, connection to networks. All these organizations that deal with violence against women have the resources, have the people, have the different um, content that can be used in terms of uh, writing about violence against women. So it would be good to have those networks, to have those databases so that um, we can collaborate and uh, create content on uh, how to fight violence against women, especially in terms of solution journalism. Thank you for that, Nduta. Um, can we get a uh, breakout room number two? Well, there's, there's a second session. Is my time over? Yes, your time is over, unfortunately. All right, no problem. Thank you for that. Uh, Claret, are you representing uh, breakout room number two? No, I was I was in breakout room number one. With oh, okay. Uh, Sunita, you can go ahead. Okay, I believe Charity was going to speak, but Charity, are you kind of coming in? Not. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so in tackling our uh, breakout session, we were looking at why women protect the men who beat them. Uh, some of the issues that came out were in defense of their partners who are uh, as breadwinners. Then the women are uh, afraid of being embarrassed, not wanting others to know the issues. Uh, that are happening in their homes. Then uh, there was also concern over managing childcare if the perpetrator is sent to prison. 
So most of the men would rather have their man home than in prison, even if they are being um, abused. Then there are also customized norms around speaking out. Uh, people rather keep whatever is going on in the home uh, silent. Women have uh, opt to remain silent because of these customized norms that do not allow them to speak out. And there was also the issue of um, keeping the issue to themselves uh, because of uh, societal status. Every woman would, like, would rather have their home uh, be perceived as intact, uh, regardless of what is happening. Um, then uh, there was also the issue of options for survivors. Uh, for survivors uh, can be perceived extreme. That is uh, court, jail issues. So women try to make sure that uh, their partners do not go to court or jail. And the issue of guilt, shame, pride, fear, and ignorance. Uh, that's part of um, things that have been mentioned about women feel guilt and uh, they are also ashamed of uh, reporting these issues of violence against women and girls. They would rather keep their rights. All right. Then, Thank you for uh, that, Charity. We'll have to just hold it there because uh, okay. we really do have to move to the next uh, breakout room to, okay. to share their views. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. It's so minute. one minute. Yes, I'm gonna. Try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, it's like you're like this one is dangerous. Um, so <laughs> I don't believe we had a repertoire, but I made some a few notes. Uh, haven't had a chance to type them out, but uh, from the people that are in the academia, uh, specifically research, it's if we want to really influence change from within, we've got to start in our universities, including, um, you know, uh, in the curricula, the content on gender, um, as, on gender as a subject, uh, and moving it from being an elective, as Emily sh shared, to being compulsory. And uh, Siju also mentioned that that's what should be done, an involvement of more women in research. Um, uh, we also have to look at ourselves. Uh, are we really educated enough about the work that we are doing? Are we empowered enough to really do the work and be sensitive to what we are uh, reporting on? And then um, also about definitely uh, educating and sensitizing the men in the newsrooms. Um, so gender sensitivity training and, and how to frame the conversations stuff that we've talked about uh, when, in, yeah. So it begins with us first and foremost and practicing what we preach. I've summarized, ne? I hope that's under what that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you. Um, I think we have one more group to hear from. So I think, I think. Um, is there another group or can we leave it there? All right. So thank you everyone for joining today's session. And I really hope you got a lot out of it. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to sort of engage with all the presentations that uh, we saw today. But there's a lot of opportunity to do that on the Wolver app. If you registered for Arm on the Wolver app, there's, there's a community section where you can chat and just exchange ideas with some of the people and really connect. Um, over to you, Dr. Yamisi. Yes, thank you so much, um, Sumaya. Thank you, Sunita, Ajumal, Charity, Clarity, Senele. Thank you so much for that really engaging session. Um, I'm really sorry that the time was so short for the breakout rooms because I could see there was so much interaction. And um, so we definitely need to do this again. I think this is an ongoing conversation. Um, I would definitely need to organize um, this kind of event again um, early next year. So thank you, everybody. And do um, check out the World Wrap, like Sumaya said, for the next sessions, which are happening in the next 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for insightful presentations and contributions. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.